Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Boris Heifetz. I'm an anesthesiologist at Stanford, and I do both clinical and uh, preclinical research uh, looking at the antidepressant effects of ketamine. And I want to thank Ben Polanka for putting this uh, panel together and Dr. Al Gabalawi for, for joining us as well. So in the next few minutes, I want to tell you about some of our work bridging the divide from mouse to human in understanding how ketamine might work and what its role might be in the perioperative period. So you can take a quick look at my disclosures. I'm going to discuss some uh, off-label investigational use of ketamine uh, as much as possible refer to peer-reviewed uh, literature unless otherwise noted. So ketamine is actually part of an emerging class of, of medicines that media and academics are loosely categorizing as psychedelic therapies. And I've listed here MDMA, psilocybin and ketamine simply because they have the best clinical evidence behind them. And while we can debate about what's really a psychedelic, the fact is that this group of drugs share a couple of remarkable properties. And these are all therapies that involve intense pharmacological and physiological manipulations that can induce profoundly different uh, states of consciousness. So in particular, each of these drugs can induce rapid therapeutic effects. And in each case, the therapeutic effect long outlasts blood levels of the drug. Um, so it is very hard to ignore the unprecedented effect sizes that have been reported uh, with these therapies and the enthusiasm for new treatments uh, for intractable mental illness has fueled these therapies rapid progress through the regulatory process. So I'd like to reiterate that many of these results are from small trials and definitive trials are still underway. And again, this is, uh, th th this is a strong signal, but it's not the final um, the final form that these therapies are likely to take simply because there's a lot we don't know um, and a lot of potential risks involved. So for example, abuse potential with uh, drugs like MDMA and ketamine, um, and we simply don't know which patients might be best suited to which forms of, of therapy for drugs like psilocybin. So focusing a little bit more on uh, ketamine, among this emerging class of therapeutics, ketamine is the strongest clinical evidence basis. It's been around for over 50 years and a number of high quality studies over the last 15 years demonstrate ketamine's rapid acting antidepressant effect. Notably, the effect doesn't seem to last very long, about a week on average after single infusion. Uh, and you can see here one of the earliest studies that uh, show that antidepressant effect quite nicely. And mainstream excitement has been building for several years now, maybe a little bit uh, over, over exuberant. Um, and what's important, uh, I think, to point out is there's a segment of the population that is prone to misusing ketamine. And even psychotherapists who work with ketamine note that some patients come for the numbing, less so for the therapy. High dose, heavy use, all that's associated with things like bladder toxicity and neurocognitive deficits. We simply don't know enough about the long-term antidepressant therapy with ketamine to be able to fully evaluate it. And again, if you're unaware of this other side of ketamine, pay a visit to Reddit. This is one of the first things I found on the ketamine subreddit. So, I want to reiterate, there is an absolute explosion in the number of clinics specializing in ketamine therapy for depression. Getting the mechanism right and understanding how this drug works and improving on it is particularly pressing for this drug. So here, what you can see is uh, our team looked at real world evidence from over 100, uh, for 178 clinics in over 40 states um, and looking at outcomes of ketamine therapy. And what I want to point out here is that just how durable this effect seems to be out in the real world. This, this therapy is not going away. Uh, it's, it, people do seem to get benefit from it. Um, and again, the issues I've noted about ketamine, its potential toxicity and its abuse liability, that's motivated the search for more precise therapeutics that can harness these therapeutic effects while minimizing abuse potential. So, as many of you know, uh, you know, one of the dominant ideas about how ketamine works uh, focuses on the NMDA receptor, which is uh, the a ubiquitous neurotransmitter uh, receptor uh, for, for glutamate. And in fact, this theory of ketamine's mechanism has dominated the preclinical literature for the last 10 years. And the story has slowly been built up to explain how antagonism of the NMDA receptor results in a surge of glutamate in prefrontal cortical areas and activation of intracellular signaling pathways like mTOR and BDNF release. So unfortunately though, preclinical models are only as good as the predictions you can make in a human. So if you walk this forward uh, into human testing, you predict that NMDA receptor antagonists might be 
cleaner versions of ketamine that are capable, again, of honing in precisely on the antidepressant mechanism without triggering all of those side effects that we're, we're less interested in. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, that's not been the case. So each of these, each of these figures is from a, a trial of various NMDA receptor antagonists and glutamate modulators that have basically failed to reproduce the rapidity or the efficacy of ketamine. So it seems that we don't understand ketamine well enough to repeat the trick, and perhaps we should cast a wider net for the mechanism. And in fact, if you look at the literature of the past 40 years, ketamine is well known to have multiple low affinity interactions that may be just as relevant as its effect at the NMDA receptor. One of those receptors is the opioid receptor. And we did the experiment. Uh, this is a double blind crossover trial. And what you see here is a ketamine response of patients in blue. Uh, were crossed over to a condition where they were pre-treated with 50 milligrams of naltrexone, and that's in red. And we found that naltrexone completely blocked ketamine's antidepressant effect, which led to quite a bit of correspondence and has opened up some new avenues of exploration for understanding how ketamine might work. Uh, I'd like to point out this is one of the very few findings that defines ketamines or any antidepressants mechanism in humans. There are not that many demonstrations that a selective pharmacological intervention can block antidepressant effects. So this, if we, if we take this as true, then this is a really good starting point for animal modeling, right? We have a pharmacological, what we hope is a fact in humans, and if we can reproduce this physiology in an animal model, Maybe we can learn something about the circuits, the receptors, the brain systems that lead to an antidepressant effect. And that's what we've set out to do recently. Uh, so there are a number of ketamine relevant mouse behaviors. Again, we're, these are the mouse lines we're looking at, which I'm not gonna go into too much detail about. And we're testing ketamine uh, and a couple opioid receptor antagonists with varying specificity for mu and kappa. And the three behaviors that we focused on are locomotion. So ketamine is known to produce this locomotor stimulating effect uh, in mice, nociception, we know ketamine is an analgesic, and the four swim test, which is a very crude measure of antidepressant-like effects, which may or may not actually reflect antidepressant activity. And again, I'm going to uh, go glide over a lot of data, but after some extensive behavioral testing, we really focused in on locomotion. The ketamine's stimulant effect seems to be opioid receptor mediated, and we can use that as a behavioral output to model and understand some of the neural events that give rise to that ketamine opioid receptor interaction. Um, this is basically what we found, again, looking just at, at, at locomotion induced by ketamine. Now, trexone and saline on their own don't do much. Ketamine enhances uh, the locomotor activity, and now trexone blocks that effect pretty completely. Uh, kappa opioid receptors don't really do it. Uh, it seems like it's mu opioid receptor antagonists that are responsible for that effect. So where do we go from here? Now we've modeled, we have a behavioral model for this, what we've observed clinically. So we don't know where in the brain this is happening. Uh, so we cast as wide a net as, as possible, making as few assumptions as we could. And this is what I'll call basically circuit-based therapeutic discovery, where we're using a, uh, a, a comparison between two states, ketamine on its own and ketamine with naltrexone and looking at the difference between those two states to hone in on brain areas that are mediating the antidepressant effect. Whatever is different between those two should be related to the antidepressant circuitry um, or at least the opioid receptor dependent circuitry of, of ketamine. Um, and again, I'll show you briefly how we do that. And what we're relying on here is immediate early genes, which are closely related to neuronal activity. Every time a neuron fires, it makes a protein called FOS, and we can map that across the brain. So we will in, we have a behavioral induction of brain activity with ketamine or ketamine and naltrexone. We clear the brains uh, so that they're optically transparent. We image them with an extremely fancy microscope. And you can see here what some of those raw images look like. We register the brains, we detect the cells, uh, and then we count them across the entire brain. We generate region-based statistics as well as voxel-based statistics to hone in on where in the brain is the hotspot. So what does that map look like? So this is looking specifically at what it, ketamine versus ketamine and naltrexone in a mouse. 
mapping the differences. And what I'd like to point out is there are a number of hot spots and cold spots um, that we picked up. One of the most interesting ones um, was actually in the central amygdala, right around here. Uh, this is something that has been implicated before uh, in ketamine's actions. And again, we didn't really have any reason to think of this before, but this is why we did a brain-wide search to look for uh, areas that might be mediating this ketamine opioid receptor interaction. And that's actually what we found. So again, this is just a, 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 a different view of the same cluster of, uh, of cells that are mediating this, that, that look different when you give a mouse ketamine versus ketamine and naltrexone. And we tested, we tested the idea directly. We infused the mu opioid receptor antagonist directly into the central amygdala, looking again at this locomotor stimulating effect. And we see that we're able to pretty effectively block it. So what taken together, this suggested activity in the central amygdala mediates the ketamine opioid system interaction. I'll point out that this interaction looks a little bit different in mice than it does in humans. And that again, teaches us something about how we should be using animal models uh, to model human, human disease states, which are, which are fairly complex. So given all of this information, you know, what is it, what, you know, we, we have uh, some a little bit more mechanistic information and, and hopefully this will yield more precise therapies. In the meantime, what do we do with ketamine in the clinic? clinic ketamine clearly has a lot of efficacy and also has issues. So maybe there's some clinical uh, specific clinical situations that might be particularly well suited to a rapid acting antidepressant. Um, and, you know, it just so happens that we're anesthesiologists and, you know, we uh, usually only address the risk factors that are right in front of us. So cardiopulmonary things are very easy to identify and treat, whereas psychiatric risk factors are um, generally it's historically been very difficult, even if we did identify them to do anything. Uh, about a psychiatric risk factor prior to surgery. We know that depression is linked to poor outcomes uh, after surgery, but again, you usually don't have time to start an SSRI and wait four to six weeks to see if it works uh, before going to surgery. So this might be a situation where a drug like ketamine might be useful. Now, in before going forward with, uh, with a project like this, I think it's useful to understand the scope of, you know, how prevalent is depression in the perioperative uh, period. So we actually started a screening program at Stanford Hospital. Um, last year, there are about uh, 16,000, 17,000 patients um, that were scheduled for major surgery, which we defined by the length of surgery. Uh, and among those, um, we screened out, we used as our, our primary uh, primary screening, uh, anybody with a history of depression on their chart, um, which was about 10%. And we know that's pretty sure that that's an undercount, that there are probably many more depressed patients that they don't typically uh, want to advertise in their EMR. Among those, 20% were currently depressed. They had symptoms of depression. Um, some of patients were directly uh, referred from a pre-op clinic. Among those, 63% were currently depressed, showing that Humans, when you ask, when, when presented with a depressed person, are very much more sensitive than uh, Epic's EMR. So, looking at these patients, you can see that there's actually a distribution. This is the PHQ8, which is a measure of depression, and you can see that the severity uh, spans the spectrum of these patients. And you can see in stippled uh, lines here, uh, these are what we would consider high risk patients, and we identify them as high risk because they have moderate or greater uh, symptomatic depression, no antidepressant uh, treatment, no psychiatric care, and in many cases, no actual diagnosis. So this is what we would think of as a high risk uh, population that we could intervene on potentially to improve patient outcomes. Um, so that's really, that's where we're at right now is maybe we can help these patients. Um, we, I'm showing you here, this is um, what we what we're already doing uh, in this perioperative mental health screening program. Um, once we identify a patient with depression, we refer them out to psychiatrists at Stanford. I refer them to trials. I refer them to local uh, mental health resources. So what you can see here is that we actually again, while some patients uh, seek outside care, many accept referrals. Only a small proportion actually decline referrals. So we have a pretty high rate of engagement. So this really is an opportunity to create the perioperative period as a point of care 
for treating mental health and potentially improving outcomes. So again, bringing this back to ketamine, you know, it's, it's, it's an obvious first pass. We have this very effective, apparently very effective rapid acting therapeutic. And so that's what we're currently at the tail end of is testing whether ketamine might be an effective antidepressant when given during general anesthesia. So we've identified uh, you know, a high risk population. And again, we're trying to see if addressing the risk factor, first of all, can affect the uh, course of depression. And second, was it associated with better overall outcomes um, in, in, in this population? So I'm going to stop there. This, uh, th this is, uh, I think, 75% of the way towards target recruitment. COVID has been awesome. Um, and I look forward to sharing that data with you as soon as it's uh, available. And um, I, want to, I want to thank a lot of people, uh, too, many, uh, too, too many to go through individually. But as I, I pointed out during uh, in these slides, you saw a lot of different names there. There are a lot of people that have put in a lot of time and effort and their expertise in making this work. So again, thank you for your attention and uh, I look forward to any questions.